afternoon, colleagues. Nice. Thank you, colleagues from the CCM cluster for having us today. Yes, I will share my screen if possible. So, Bruce, can I can I start? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. So thanks a lot again. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Roberta Romano. I am a migration policy officer, officer for the International Organization for Migration, IOM, based in Washington, DC. It's uh, my pleasure today to be um, with you CCCM experts and practitioners to share our work in um, pushing an important agenda, which is um, strengthening the engagement of diasporas in humanitarian assistance, but in a way that is a little bit more streamlined than what has happened so far, and that hopefully can increase the effectiveness of the interventions in humanitarian assistance that diaspora organizations and actors are already uh, carrying on, and also you know, maximizing each other's um, strength and added value as we increase and improve the way in which we work with one another. So I will share briefly my screen. I'm here with my colleague, Azemri Howie, um, who uh, works for the, um, the, the Coalition for uh, American Syrian um, uh, Organizations. And he will tell us his experience of working with uh, IDPs and refugees, Syrian IDPs and refugees in host countries and in Syria. So very interesting firsthand uh, experience of how diaspora's engagement really made a difference uh, in terms of supporting communities in need. So I'll, um, I'll share my screen now and give you a little bit of the ground of how we got here and um, what we are currently doing. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Um, so what is the rationale behind what we are doing. So um, obviously, you know, okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Let me see if I can do the slide here. Okay, it doesn't, okay, it's okay. It doesn't, uh, I don't know, it doesn't allow yeah, me to do it. Yes, yes, okay, here, here it is, yeah. Um, so we have a threefold rationale for this project and for this initiative. On one hand is that we are looking, of course, at what we are all very familiar with as humanitarian workers, which is an increased number of conflicts and disasters. And of course, increased number of displacements and people affected by either natural disaster or man-made uh, man conflict. And um, it, these are 235.4 million is the name of people in need, uh, according to OCHA for 2021, which unfortunately represent a very steep increase comparing to 2020, which was 167.6 million. And of course, we are all aware of the fact that our response as humanitarian community always falls short of need. And, um, and we have realized a long time ago, of course, that we need a multi-stakeholder approach to the, to the assistance. And um, uh, of course, like most of, the, most of the needs are caused by conflicts, natural disaster, displacement, climate change, and economic stress. And uh, obviously the last, um, the, the experience we are just, um, you know, still um, the, 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 the global pandemic we are still experiencing has been uh, exacerbating needs already existing uh, globally. Um, so, Unfortunately, also we have seen in 2019 that the assistance has declined for the first time since 2012. So there is um, and there is the need to you know to approach assistance in a different way, in a way that is more sustainable, that is uh, that, that is more that is more increasingly aimed at increasing uh, resilience of affected communities, and also um, that uh, is able to strengthen and leverage the contributions of different actors like diaspora communities. So, uh, you know, what are diaspora's organizations already doing? And I will give you a brief, uh, you know, more, probably most of you are already familiar with, but, you know, uh, diasporas are often um, known as uh, just, um, you know, global remitters and the remittances have uh, spiked um, significantly in 2019. Um, they have reached uh, a record high of 70, 719 billion. Uh, and even in 2020, although the World Bank had, um, uh, foreseen, had, had forecasted a decrease of remittances uh, up to 19.5%, uh, 
in, in fact, we have seen that there has been only a decrease of 1.5%. And this really is a testimony to the, to the deep commitment of diasporas um, towards uh, communities, uh, affected communities in their countries of origin. So these are just some, uh, you know, some areas in which diaspora actors and organizations provide a key contribution. They are usually first responder, respond independently, share significant resources, remain engaged before, during, and after a disaster. And that's particular. This is quite important, I think, as we're trying to, you know, as we've been trying as humanitarian actors to think about ways to bridge you know, the humanitarian and development uh, context and also look at humanitarian assistance in a way that can mainstream uh, recovery and resilience since the very beginning. Uh, as I said, you know, remittances are probably the, you know, the aspects for which diasporas are most um, well known, but there is much more to that. They are often sending volunteers, they send, um, uh, they have their own projects of, um, uh, of humanitarian response. Um, they also are, they are also, not, they're not, they don't, they not only, um, you know, send remittances, which are more, uh, you know, family to family type of financial flow, but also they are responsible for a very significant uh, philanthropic effort. Um, they also, they have, a tr they, they have this capacity to, um, represent transnational networks, especially when they are able to mobilize diasporas across different countries of residence, as we will hear in the case of ARCs, of our colleagues of the Syrian diaspora, but also they are, you know, they're very closely connected to local actors. And in this sense, uh, I really, we really believe that they can support our effort of localization. And finally, also they serve as advocates for uh, the needs, uh, the longer term needs of communities uh, in countries of origin. Um, so in particular, what they are doing, what, what we've seen in our work that has been comprised over the last few years of uh, several consultations, uh, meetings and events, uh, as well as um, literature review and surveys, with diasporas, um, they, they, diasporas also have a specific role in income coordination, income management. And um, I think the Syrian experience is quite significant, but also other uh, diasporas uh, that we are working with, like the Filipino diasporas and the Haitian diasporas, I think they have very interesting experience when it comes to contribution to the CCCM work. Uh, some examples are remittances and in-time donations sent to, sent to IDPs and refugees in camp settings. And camp settings intended both as the, um, you know, the formal camp setting and also the more informal ones. Um, then skills transfer and contributing to programs, uh, to programming camp settings, for example, vocational and educational efforts. And this is particularly true in uh, sectors like education, health, uh, livelihoods promotion, youth programming and media. And then supports needs assessment and community engagement. And again, probably another important aspect is promoting initiatives that can, uh, can also bridge the humanitarian assistance and more the longer term development um, focus. So a little bit about, so this is the background that we are working against. And uh, what about a few years ago, thanks to um, our colleagues at the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance and the shelter team, I think I saw Chuck uh, Shell with us before, and we're very, you know, we've been able, thanks to their, um, you know, sensitivity toward the, this issue, to step up a work that IOM was already doing uh, in engaging diasporas in um, post-crisis uh, recovery. IOM has a very long-standing experience of engaging diasporas, uh, not only for development, but also for uh, post-crisis recovery. For example, um, you know, in the case of Somalia in the, and also the reconstruction of the health system post Ebola in uh, West Africa. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, we started with engaging diasporas for a specific uh, sector, um, sector with a specific sector focus in shelter and settlement to try to um, uh, provide an alternative angle in promoting separate shelters in humanitarian assistance by engaging diasporas and increasing their capacities of what safer shelter means uh, before, during, and after a crisis. But last year, also always thanks to funds from the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, the Public-Private uh, Partnership Unit, we have been uh, we have been expanding our work uh, across different sectors. And so we are looking now at 
a, a broader um, you know, a broader approach of engaging diasporas in humanitarian assistance by developing and piloting a framework. So the idea is that the, the, the basic premise is that we hope is correct. And I think uh, been talking here to uh, colleagues from a cluster, I think you, you would agree with us, is that coordination is beneficial. So although coordination can be demanding and time consuming and sometimes expensive, there are deep benefits to be able to work more closely together in a more streamlined and systematic way. So the idea is to try to bridge a bit the gap between the work that you, diaspora organizations are already conducting independently and, uh, and spontaneously to the work that uh, other institutional humanitarian actors are implementing. So the project's main objective is to increase the ability of diaspora organizations and institutional humanitarian actors to effectively engage, communicate, and coordinate with one another when responding to humanitarian disasters. So the overall vision is to establish a working model for a, model for a more streamlined engagement of diaspora in, in the humanitarian sector. So it's quite ambitious and uh, really requires a very, uh, it requires the, the, the participation and um, the views of all the actors that eventually will need to use the, the, the framework. And I'll, I will tell you a little bit more about how we are going about the developing of the framework. So one thing just that we are not really, in, you know, this project does not, uh, that was, did not come in a vacuum. So uh, there were past efforts uh, of working with diasporas to rebuild uh, strength and strengthen government and civil society institutions. As I said, focusing on post-conflict reconstructions. These are just some examples of IOM programs in Afghanistan, Bosnia Herzegovina, Iraq, Serbia, Somalia, and as I said, in the post Ebola um, context in West Africa. But then probably the most relevant uh, you know, milestone in this conversation has been the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016, where for the first time, uh, a number of actors, including IOM and, um, and, and, and other colleagues from the Diaspora Emergency uh, action and coordination platform called uh, named as uh, uh, known as the MAC brought a number of humanitarian actors uh, at, the, at the WHS and um, came out with a statement of commitment that we are trying now to push forward in a more practical way. And then, of course, we've been trying to you know gather the momentum and maintain the momentum through presenting the importance of this uh, work in different humanitarian fora, like the HNPW week, both in 2018, 2020, and even this year in 2021 virtually. Um, so however, because there was, despite this widespread interest in diaspora's increased role as humanitarian actors, their engagement in disaster response was yet to be systematically explored and coordinated with other actors for maximum impact. So, and that's where the project comes in. So just briefly about what are the main project, three, we have three main project goals uh, that can be summarized in this, um, in this visual. So the first one is to work, in, uh, to work towards supporting diaspora actors and in particular diaspora organizations in increasing their, their role, the increasing and strengthening their internal coordination. Obviously, I think it was quite clear both to diasporas and other uh, external humanitarian actors that in order for this coordination to be effective, First, diasporas need to be uh, need to be uh, more like better better coordinated internally, so that their capacity to represent even small and medium organizations vis-a-vis -vis other actors uh, is uh, is enhanced. So we this is the blue arrow that we have been working on together with a group of sixteen diaspora leaders. Um, and Azem uh, that is here today, today with us is one of them. And this is uh, toward the creation of uh, a model for internal diaspora coordination that can be adapted and, um, and tailored to the needs of different diaspora communities. Then there is the orange arrow, which represents this external coordination between diasporas and um, institutional humanitarian actors. And here for, for institutional humanitarian actors, we mean actors um, you know, at the global level mostly as a reference point, we mean mostly the clusters, of course, but also uh, other, you know, other coordination fora or even individual institutions, both UN and international NGOs. And then the yellow arrow that represents uh, the country level um, uh, dimension, where diasporas and international actors meet with, um, you know, concerned uh, national and local uh, governments 
and also um, other local actors like local NGOs, uh, CSOs, and affected communities uh, to really, you know, provide a more effective and, uh, and enhanced humanitarian assistance. So these are the three main uh, goals of our project. We are now in, uh, we are approaching phase number three, which is the piloting of the global framework at two country level, which is, um, which are Haiti and Philippines. So the methodology we've used so far is a mixed, uh, it's a mixed methodology made of a desk review of all, of all what is done, so what was done so far in terms of understanding the diaspora's engagement in humanitarian assistance, although there is no much, but you know, what is available is interesting. And then for consultations with diaspora actors, institutional humanitarian actors and diaspora experts, two surveys, one, um, one directed toward uh, diaspora leaders. We had about 180 respondents um, that gave us their view, especially on issues of internal and external coordination, and, and then a working group. As I say, it's very important for this process to be highly participatory and consultative. We are not intending to produce a, a product that respond, that really just reflects IOM views and assumptions about this issue, but is um, really is built on uh, the needs and the views of actors, both diasporas and other humanitarian actors that eventually are going to use the framework. So I have, a, I have a few slides here on what we have learned through the desk review and through the surveys, but I think in the sake of time, I will um, skip them. But if you are interested, we are now uh, you know, consolidating all, the, all what we have learned uh, in, uh, in individual pieces of publications that, we, that will be made public and hopefully will uh, provide uh, you know, a contribution to the, to the knowledge uh, on this issue. So I will, I will skip this. Um, some things we have learned are quite, you know, are just a confirmation of what we've already thought, and others uh, gave us a little bit more nuanced understanding of what diasporas and other humanitarian actors are expecting from one another. Um, so, as I say, okay, I'm going to move on. Um, so these are interesting. As you see, the majority of diaspora organizations inter intervene in humanitarian assistance is about 86 percent, um, uh, majority of them operate in coordination with other diaspora groups. Uh, top five sector of interventions are education, health, gender, women, children, and food security. The biggest constraints and barrier were, when engaging were funding, limited capacities, but also lack of coordination with other key international actors. And that's what we're trying to, is the gap we're trying to fill in this project. Um, I'm gonna go ahead. So this is just a, a, um, this is a very draft um, model that we have that we have produced so far, and we are working on finalizing it. As I said, on one end we have a model for internal coordination, which I've not uh, I've not um, recorded here. But then this is what we are working on when it comes to the external coordination. So here you see all the different actors involved, and we're trying to understand. Or, you know, we're trying to build the flows and see what would be the best and the most effective entry point for diaspora and institutional humanitarian actors to work with one another. And also what would be the best um, channels of communication and co coordination and the, and the best flows for this, um, for this engagement at the global level, at the country level. The last thing I would like to mention is one practical tool we are already in working on when it comes to diaspora engagement, uh, and, it's a two, and it's a standard operating procedures for um, diaspora engagement and shelter cluster actors under the global cluster. Um, and these are just examples of our SOPs. We are advancing on the work of the SOPs and it should be ready by September. So I thought this could be an interesting inspiration maybe also for, for the CCCM cluster in order to you know, have a very practical understanding of how this type of engagement can be broken down in different phases in the preparedness and the assistance phase. Okay, I will stop here. Uh, I'll give the floor to Azam just to share his experience. Yeah, thank you, Roberta. Um, I mean, uh, thank you all for inviting me to this and uh, for, uh, for all the work that you have been doing. And I would like to share the experience of ARCS here uh, on why we are engaging with IOM and how it will benefit uh, the, the whole, even the cluster system in general. 
So American Relief Coalition is a coalition of 11 Syrian American organizations. They all are Syrian diaspora that have lived in the United States since uh, all from the, like older generations that have come here, the migrants, everything was going. When the Syrian crisis started, um, they were the, maybe the first to mobilize to support the communities in general. In assist, I, I mean, usually when the uh, what happened with us in Syria is that when the context started, local organization did the grassroots were the first to respond, and they were supported by the diaspora. Later on, these organizations, the Syrian diaspora, became more formalized and they became more engaged in the humanitarian response. Um, that was, in general, a good way to support even work with INGOs and the UN agencies. So um, the, the response, of course, as you can imagine, it was what Roberta was talking about is more on the financial side, on the expertise side, on, on these technical things, but never in a coordinated way uh, that would, that the system, the humanitarian response in one way. Um, the coalition here that started with ARCS was an idea that came that these organizations need to influence and advocate on behalf of these Syrian organizations in Washington, D.C. as the capital and New York City. So our work mainly is to talk to the Congress, to the Senate, to the politicians and explain the context and try to increase the support coming for the Syrian diaspora and for the localization. So as you can think about it, these diaspora are influential in their host communities, in their space that they work in. And at the same time, they have the linkages and the works in the CCCM. Um, I work, I'm originally from Syria and I work as a cluster coordinator. And I know the importance that these diaspora organizations have in double or two. Uh, when when I am asked me to present over my work on health, but I think what's whatever I'm talking about is much related to you as cluster coordinators. When you see the local organization, the diaspora becoming more and more influential by time. So um, even with ARCs in itself, and as it grew up, and these Syrian diaspora organization became more influential, uh, more and more. As Syrian community, also we not. We noticed internally that we also have similar structures to ours in other countries. So uh, we created something called a Syria Coordination Networks Platform. It's a platform for similar organizations like, like ARCs in other countries. So we have a colleague, for example, a similar structure like us works in the UK, in Germany, and, and other countries. So now we have this platform where we exchange ideas and we work together uh, and uh, try to promote the same thing that we are, because we have in the end the same goal. Um, I have reached out to us and talked about the similar engagement on, on diaspora. And I think it's a great idea because one thing that's uh, highlighted for us is, first of all, our contribution to the global effort of the humanitarian response. As Syrians, we struggled a little bit to understand the system, and we don't think this could be, um, there should be, uh, like other contexts should save the face issues, like preparing the diaspora at this kind of time of context, creating systems that will allow them to be engaged and to be fully engaged with the structure as quickly as possible, and not to disrupt the system as much as possible also, because it's all the work that all of us are doing, the diaspora do not become engaged on it until the context in itself become uh, important. So this is one of the ways that we are now working with uh, with the uh, with the IOM on this context on on this project, and also putting in mind that I keep highlighting to Roberta all the time that we need to have um, that there are localization in each context by context differs. Um, yeah, and uh, many Syrian and diaspora organizations work in CCCM. I know Syrian Forum has done that, um, and other contexts. We try to cover all uh, sectors as much as possible, but mostly uh, we're trying to coordinate also. And this is where the diaspora links between the local organization and the NGO. Um, that's all from my side, Roberta. I mean, if there are any questions or if there's anything, please feel free to interrupt. Thank you, Azam. So I think we have about five minutes uh, before the end of our time. So if there is any question with either for me or Azam, we'd be happy to, to respond. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you very much, both of you. Um, that was very interesting. And I think um, it's it seems like it's a very valuable exercise. Um, you know, I think as, as I, from my point of view, I think perspective coming from uh, the CCCM world, <clears throat> I think as people have said before, you know, we are very sort of pragmatic people. And sometimes we we fail, I think, to look outside of the camp or the you know adjacent communities and look at the wider world that exists and other resources that we're able to call upon. Um, and I think you know the 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 outputs from this research project are going to be really interesting. I might just ask a couple of questions, um, maybe to kind of like draw a little bit more of a link towards how we can um, you know if if I'm a camp manager and I'm and I'm uh, you know, involved in an emergency response in the camp, you know, I will look at any tools that are available in order to help me coordinate that response. Um, you know, how would diaspora organizations, I mean, maybe, you know, you said you had some examples, not struck, like, you know, very, um, you know, not a huge data set, but maybe some anecdotal examples of diaspora organization engagement in, um, in emergency response, you know, what those look like. And then also, I think my second question is, if you could elaborate a little bit more on how the shelter cluster is um, engaging more with diaspora organizations, because I think that's a very good example where we can learn some lessons. Adam, you want to take the first question for Syria, and um, I'll take the second one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you. Thank you Bruce, for this question. Um, the thing, uh, what I'm thinking about how it can management, I mean, putting in mind that whenever, uh, I'll take the example from Syria and the context that we are working in. Um, the camp management works with a lot of organizations, and many of the grassroots organizations, most probably their funding comes from donations from diaspora and from other organizations. They have these, this link that comes in. And uh, Syrian diaspora uh, organization even become an organization by themselves, and they always become in that shift between are they an INGO or are they a local organization? So we try now to facilitate this and make this as smooth as possible. Diaspora can engage with the system um, if they know about the CCCM, because uh, as, as you say, uh, whenever a crisis happens, the diaspora does not understand the system. They try to support the people, they try to support the grassroots, the linkages, but not the system. So the idea is to facilitate this kind of discussion. Um, to, to understand the system, how CCCM works, how the system works in general, and how they can complement in all of these things. So um, I think I think this is would be the uh, I hope this is would be the result of, of this exercise is to facilitate this first of all at the global level. So whenever the diaspora engage in general, we have the system prepared for them to build up. And secondly, to, uh, to make these uh, things available to the diaspora themselves whenever a context arrives. So let's say a context arrives somewhere, the diaspora will know that they, they have a reliable system that they can learn from and build up. So that's at least my perspective on this. And Roberta, if you have anything to add, I mean, this is how I'm thinking about it uh, when we. Yeah, no, I think. Context. Uh, definitely, like our our desk review and our surveys have uh, highlighted a number of interesting examples of how diasporas has been engaging diaspora organizations. And actually, there are also two recent publications uh, from other colleagues that are working on this issue. Uh, one uh, from the MAP looking at the case of Ukraine, another one from the UDIF looking at the case of it's just a global, just a general overview of diaspora engagement. And we are coming up with our publication in a few months. And Definitely, what is interesting is that diaspora's engagement is usually not so sector specific as it is for the clusters. It's much more, you know, across sectors and often, and that's why sometimes the work, the work in coordination within the cluster can be a bit uh, reductive, a little bit narrow for diaspora organizations that are, are, are interested in responding to the needs as they, as they are, or whether there are um, organizations of professionals, and this is particularly true, for example, in the health sector with doctors and nurses that uh, have a more, much more specialized um, and focused assistance. Um, we have actually an interesting data from the survey, and I think this is interesting for the PCM, is that only 2% of the respondents of the survey among the diaspora organization leaders that we have engaged say that they responded that they actually work in CCCM. So this one, this makes us wonder whether they, most diaspora probably don't know what's, what really camp coordination and camp management looks like. 
because as as you I mean as you know better than I, uh, you know the the work of camp of CCTM has evolved so much over the years, including formal and informal settings and uh, urban versus more formalized camps. So I think diaspora's organization might not be even aware that they are supporting the you know the CCTM effort, but maybe they are already doing it. So I think. One important element, and this is what this connects me to the second part of your question, Bruce, which is the work under the shelter cluster. I think one first step could be really to socialize the diasporas and CCTM actors with one another, and you know share um, do a little bit of uh, sharing of uh, of experiences and best practices, and also to explain you know to first of all to let the shelter to let CCCM actors know what diasporas are doing and vice versa to have diasporas organization understanding what it's meant by CCCM work what are the most uh, recent trends and uh, you know the most important developments of the sector and I think this could be I think something the first step we could do and and that's how we started with the with the shelter cluster by just uh, doing trainings and capacity building for the diaspora on explaining what is shelter, which is much more than the physical structure and how it affects all the other sectors of people's life and dignity and livelihood and uh, protection and so on. So this could be a first thing. And then the other one, it was, we created a working group under the global shelter cluster, which is mixed of diaspora actors and shelter clusters and shelter cluster actors. And the working group is developing these SOPs. So this is another way to have the conversation more, you know, open and, con and continue. So that's from my side. No, for sure. I think I think that's a really great answer. And I think some of the, in case you're not aware, and maybe if other people on the call aren't aware, you know, the CCM cluster is moving forward with a with a localization task force um, over the next few months. And I think you know some of the things that you've highlighted about the the barriers and misunderstandings of you know, of what is CCCM or the, you know, the the issues around jargon and language about understanding what it is are very similar to what maybe local NGOs, uh, you know, experience when they're trying to implement humanitarian aid. So it'd be great to sort of like discuss with you as in particular, your experiences in Syria and how that can, um, you know, how that can feed into, into that work. Um, we have uh, a question in the chat here that um, I think um, Rob is okay if we <clears throat> spend another minute or two on questions before moving to the next presentation. Um, the question is, how does the shelter cluster in Somalia involve, how does it involve in the management of camps, especially returnees, though they are not returned, what are the main plans and strategy? Laban, I don't know if you want to maybe ask your question, um, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, because um, it's not entirely clear. No, okay, well, maybe we can clarify in the chat and you guys can have a conversation um, uh, in the chat box. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, this will be online. And I think um, if you're okay, we'll also have your presentation shared online on the CCM cluster website. So thank you very sure. much. Really thank you. It. Thank you CCM colleagues for the opportunity. Have a good afternoon. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Azam. Thank you, Bruce. Well, of course, of course. Bye -bye.